Hey, thank you for joining us for another edition of Three Squares, the November edition. We hope that you are preparing for or have had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, we can talk a little bit about what's on your table. Kevin, is, is Thanksgiving figure into the quiz today at all, by chance? Slightly. Oh, I just have Slightly. to be very careful because both of you are very competitive. And I want to make sure. I didn't I'm going to go, oh, it's going to be about Thanksgiving. And I know both of you have probably been studying up. So I have to be tricky. Uh, I we're we're, we're tricky. competitive. What are you talking about? No, yeah, I yeah, know you're not. There you go. It's, I'm it's Charlie Harnott with the Center for Food Integrity and Look East, working to keep food trustworthy, along with my fantastic co-host, Kevin Ryan and Susan Schwally. And I'm Susan Schwally with Circana. We're a leading advisor on the complexities of consumer behavior. And I'm Kevin Ryan with Malachi Strategy and Research, and we help CPG and retail companies at the front end of innovation. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we're going to spend our time today. For those of you who who don't subscribe, you should, and you probably will after this. But Kevin sends out a regular newsletter called Culture Matters, and it is filled with wisdom and insight and uh, really fun things to kind of think about. But there are a couple of the, the things that struck me, and, and Kevin, it's your newsletter, so you can obviously take us in a different direction. But I thought it was fascinating when you kind of uh, the, the conversation about the transition away from plant-based to clean and that actually came up today uh, earlier as uh, Eve Toro Paul was talking about the move to more vegetarian uh, dishes on co- college campuses, et cetera. But she, mm-hmm. she, she made the same comment, right? That it's not about having a, an alternative to a burger. Right. It's about embracing dishes that should be vegetable based, whether they are Asian or Indian or, or, or a lot of the cuisine around the world has more vegetables than the cuisine of the United States. But I thought it was really interesting, particularly the the Mary Douglas quote that dirt is matter out of place. So yeah. help us understand kind of what's what's what are you seeing and what's driving this? Well, I've been seeing, I'd be interested in both of you, um, but I've been seeing the similar type of trend for a while now. I mean, yes, plant-based has, you know, definitely been something that we've been talking about and you've been seeing on labels and things, but the amount of people who I've seen who, have talked about wanting health, have talked about wanting, um, you know, uh, real food and all that kind of stuff, you know, continues to be the thing they talk about, or they even say like, I want something healthy, but when you really, you know, that's on a, on a survey. Yes. I want something healthy, but when you talk to them, what they mean is real ingredients, things that I can pronounce, you know, it's the same thing that we've heard for years. That seems to be what's coming to the top. So it could be that it is a vegetable. It could be that it is something, but this idea of clean, this idea of um, something that hasn't been touched. And that's where that, you know, that quote comes from. um, That seems to just make sense to consumers. And I I just think that that's what's replacing or that's what's going to be the the focus going forward. So that's what I wrote about (laughs) it for just because I keep seeing it. So I don't know. What what do you guys see? Well, Okay, so Kevin, I'm going to push back on you a little bit. Yeah, on this. please. Um, I think I pushed back you on you on our last quiz about Did the you? pumpkin. I questioned your knowledge, so I don't know what's going on with me. Um, you were right though about the pumpkin. I was. Wrong. I was right about the pumpkin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the clean thing, I think, is interesting, I, and and I realize some of what I'm going to say may have to do with my own bias towards what that term means. Mm-hmm. Um, and you do acknowledge it's squishy, right? It is. It oh, is. Yeah. Absolutely. And part of it is I look at some of the products that are in this space and how they're evolving and they actually don't feel very clean to me. I feel like there's a lot of technology. There's a lot of application of different foods and things as substitutes like fermented sugar cane instead of seed oils. Like to me, this plant-based new direction, I think is a lot about different functionality and bringing like whether it's addressing sustainability or whether there were two products in your newsletter about free of the top eight allergens, free of the top nine Mm -hmm. allergens, aquafaba as a substitute for something else. I go back to the fact that we do not see vegetable consumption increasing in Americans. We haven't seen it for decades. I don't know that people actually want more vegetables or plants, they I think they say they do, but I think the products in the plant-based space are doing really interesting things that are bringing new options to people. And a lot of times it's in a flavor profile, it's in a new variety seeking behavior, it's in an allergy free, like I just look at it as more options. I feel like yeah. plant-based because it can be surrogates for so many different things 
and you can use it in different ways and you can source different plant-based material, like from different countries and bring it together that it feeds that variety seeking kind of thing. And I know that was really rambling, but no, no, it, 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 here's the thing. I think the difference is, is, is that I'm not saying that clean eating or clean ingredients is the new way to talk about plant-based. I'm saying that plant-based is as a, as a, uh, as a benefit that people are talking about or something is starting to decrease mm -hmm. the benefit that will increase beyond just vegetable things, beyond just everything is clean. That's what I mean is about how plant-based have become the, the benefit du jour where everyone was putting it on their labels and all this kind of stuff. All I'm saying is, is that clean seems to be the one that's that's winning out beyond just things that are plant-based. So that, yeah. I think that's the difference between- So what is, can we talk about what like clean, because because it is very subjective. I know Charlie, you want to weigh in there. When this, when clean first, what was it? 10 years ago when we got yeah. clean beauty. eating. Yeah. And it was really about processed food. So mm -hmm. like, how are you defining that now? Because I think that's where I'm getting hung up. And I'm really curious what you're seeing around this. So the way that I define it, which you, as you said, it's very subjective, but where I'm hearing from consumers is, is that things I can, things I can recognize mm -hmm. things that are not, uh, that are free of allergy, because I see that as being, again, I go back to, as we were talking about this idea of what clean means, which is, um, nothing's out of place. Right. So it's like, I assume that things are going to be in the right place. It's the things I would expect in my food. It's the things, whereas I don't think that this allergen should be there. I'm not eating anything with milk. Why is there milk in here? You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean about when people say it's, so it's, it's real. It's, uh, things I would expect. And, um, so it's, the, I think it's at that level. It's at that high of a level. That's okay. and when people say, I want something clean, that's what they're talking about. So, it may get down to the idea of things that are, um, you know, uh, unexpected amounts of sugar, unexpected amounts of th things like that. But um, maybe that 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 could be for you know particular folks. But I don't know. I want to let Charlie weigh in. Yeah. Here too. yeah, yeah. From my perspective, when we saw the the initial spike, pretty significant spike in in sampling of of plant based alternatives. To me, it was a signal that there is a tremendous demand for better for me, better for the planet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for that. But but as we've seen, I think pretty consistently, the food system then jumps in and overcomplicates it and makes it much harder than it needs to be. And uh, I think the, the whole idea of clean being something that, that individuals define for themselves uh, is probably not a bad way to think about it because the, 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 the other side of that uh, continuum is the Nova classifications which make this, again, way too complicated. And what people are looking for is give me a simple tool, give me a simple solution, give me foods where I understand the ingredients, I know the name, I have some basic understanding of the functionality, and I can be comfortable with that as an option that's better for me. Now, mm -hmm. I'll make different determinations about whether it's better for the planet. And when food prices begin to wane a bit and inflation has softened a bit, um, then, then questions around sustainability and and other will begin to to seep back into those decision making processes. But today they don't. Yeah. Um, today it's can I afford it? Does it taste good? Is it going to be what I expect in terms of aligned with my basic values? Yeah. And so I I think the you know the food system tends to come in and look at this, does an awful lot of analysis, and sometimes overcomplicates what is a fairly simple desire. The other thing that I thought was int I think is interesting. Is is that clean hasn't been politicized is not the right word, but in a sense niche nicheified. And yeah. so what I mean is is that plant based is a particular mindset, or it is claimed by yeah. certain folks, source things. Whereas clean doesn't seem to be doing that, at least in my interaction with consumers. Clean is it, it spans. Uh, different groups. They all seem to say clean, no matter if you're, like I said, on the on the coast or in the heartland, the cl clean is something you hear versus plant-based, which tends to be, well, I, yeah, I'm not going to align myself with plant-based because I see that as a particular mindset. That's mm -hmm. why I think other, another reason I think clean makes a broader um, claim now. Yeah, that makes sense, Kevin. I mean, I wrote in my in the margin on your your note that vegan and plant based are too narrow. Mm -hmm. It's too narrow, and it's just not enough. I think yeah. it's the additional functionality or additional benefits that it brings 
people. And I think it has a lot of bandwidth and ability to do that on multiple levels. I mean, not just clean, but also I go back to, you made a comment that clean, if I think about clean, you made the comment about control. Mm -hmm. That's really what we're talking about, whether you're going for the allergy free or good for the planet or your own definition of clean. Right. So I, I do, um, I'll, I'm going to come around on this. Yeah. I'm going to come around, Kevin. The other thing that was interesting this morning that, that Eve brought up on the, on the call was that on college campuses, what they're seeing is, as they introduce more global cuisines, they don't talk about them being plant-based or vegetable-based or whatever. It's just, here's this global cuisine for you to try or something you might like. And it it's terrific. I mean, the demand is is significant because people mm-hmm. are interested in, oh, this sounds good. It tastes good. I like it. I'm on board, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't do it because of some philosophical alignment or because of some desire to be uh, plant-based or not plant-based. I just like the flavor. It, it is a nice combination of flavors and, 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 and a mouthfeel. I'm going to enjoy this and away they go. Right. Yeah. I do think it's interesting though, like Kevin, you'll remember the time that I reached out to you and said, why did my dairy, non-dairy coffee creamer just make me sick? Mm-hmm. Because listeners, Kevin is like basically a food scientist and yeah, he gets, Charlie gets my ag questions. Kevin gets my food ingredients. So I sent him the labels and you identified an ingredient that actually is very hard I won't, for people to digest. And I think that's another piece of this though, that where it could jump the shark, you have to be really careful about using different products, different right. yep. plant-based things as substitutes or putting them together because people may not understand them. Yeah. Yep. That's why I think clean and trust do come together because again, as I mentioned about control and about what I expect, if it's not what I expect, or if I feel like it is, um, you know, misleading in some ways, there is that aspect of trust, which I know Charlie is our expert here on trust. So I think there's that clean has some aspects of that as well. Great point. All right, let's transition and talk a little bit about AI. Uh, I think the algorithm has told me now is the time to speak about AI. So let's go ahead and jump into that conversation. Uh, but you referenced the paradox of choice and some of the work that's going on in 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 Pizza Hut and Walmart and others, uh, which I found really fascinating. So what are you seeing, Kevin? And uh, the mood pizza, I don't know that I'm going to go for wow. that, but it's an interesting application. Well, I think that what's interesting to me is I the way that I usually think about any type of consumer trend is I push it to its extreme to understand what it could, you know, what impact it could have on, 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 on society. And when I think about AI, I'm looking at some of these things and I, you know, I reference some of Walmart's AI tools and Pizza Hut in India as well, but Samsung food, just, they, they just, Samsung just launched a new app called Samsung food uh, and Instacart is using AI as well. And all of them do something really interesting, which is they, they start to take the consumer out of the equation. And they start to make choices currently where the consumer is basically weighing in, but I can see a point in the future where the consumer is not weighing in as much and that the, the, the consumer is basically outsourcing choice to the AI because it's, you know, uh, for some people, maybe it's a staple product or maybe it's mm-hmm. something that it's like, I, as long as you hit within this price range and, uh, you know, then fine, go ahead and buy it. So I can see a point in the future where, as I put it, the, the AI is the new consumer gatekeeper, where as a brand, you're no longer selling to the the mom or the dad or whoever's you know in the household. You're selling to AI because it's been given the choice. It has been given the ability to make the choice. And I think that's an interesting future. And that would be a very different future uh, when, in, when it comes to marketing. Well, we see it right now in lots of other places outside food, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and part of me says bring it because it's it helps with decisions, right? I mean, yeah. my Spotify now has a new function I didn't ask for, DJ, and it pl- it's an algorithm. Yeah. I get it. It's yeah. just an algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. But he talks to me and talks to me about my music choices and plays stuff and tells me where I can go to concerts. Mm-hmm. You know, he's going to just pre-buy the tickets for me and get the babysitter soon. Yeah. But- <laughs> The thing that scares me as someone who works with big CPG, though, is is that there's a potential that the AI would, yeah, to influence, but also that the consumer never sees my product because it has been, AI has already um, curated it for them. Curated it out. Yes. Yeah. 
No, I agree. There's lots of dangers with it, but I I do think it's very, I think it's polarizing and I think some aspect of it is very appealing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's so early to, in the process, it's just going to be fascinating to see how this continues to unfold. And the next big conference at McCormick will be inviting all the different AI applications to come and see your products because that way they'll they'll recommend them. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the mood pizza, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say there is, there's a, there's a company out there and I haven't visited their site in a while, so I might be misrepresenting it, but called Sifter. And it basically will, you tell Sifter, like my, my partner is keto. I'm gluten intolerant. My son has these allergies and then Sifter will go and working through Walmart, working through Safeway or wherever you are, they will sift their their choices, their AI, their 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 you know their grocery choices, and supply you only with the things, right. you know the choices that make sense to you and your family. So basically, discarding anything that doesn't. So as a, as as a manufacturer, they have basically put a film or a skin over it and said. These are not something to even choose anymore. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely terrifying. But I mean, I guess if I look at, if you're a manufacturer, if I look at it though, isn't it even, doesn't it become even more about marketing to needs, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, and and I looked at, I I mean, I am, I want to go to India and try mood pizza because like, what is it going to come up with when it looks at my face? Right. Um, But that's another intersection the mood thing was like another intersection of this that I thought was so interesting because so much of health and wellness right now, and even some products, you would know more than me, Kevin, because you watch us so closely, all the product new stuff are around mental health yeah. and support of mental health. Like to me, that's, that's like needs marketing to another level and to have something read your mood. Like that to me is what really blew my mind when I read, when I read your newsletter because they, I mean, companies have, have been, jobs to be done theory has been out there forever, right? Right. It's happening now. It happens to an extent with an algorithm. If you're buying online, it will start to pick up on patterns you're shopping and you might have certain needs around it. But this whole other level bringing it into things like mood um, is really fascinating. So in our last podcast, you know, we had Mike Wolf on talking about his conference coming up, AI and Food and Ag, and I attended that. It's also pretty fascinating how AI is being applied in product development. Um, mm-hmm. there was a company that's working very closely with PepsiCo and with many others. Uh, they're embedded in the PepsiCo offices in Plano, really helping them develop new products and then test them using, um, you know, you've got 13 or 1500 digital twins. So you can do your market research and your market testing in seconds rather than weeks or months. Um, and I was talking to, to one of the owners of the company after the meeting, he said, yeah, if, 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 if they were, they were talking to somebody who wanted to introduce an energy drink, eat, drink in Brazil. They pulled, they pulled out 300 digital twins for their target market and were able to give them feedback instantaneously about what would be accepted, what isn't, you know, how you'd want to begin to shape the brand, your market strategy, et cetera. So again, all of this is going to start happening much more quickly. And um, the, the challenge will be, can we get comfortable with it? And where are the, um, you know, h- how do we prevent the the algorithms from misbehaving or taking over or doing activity that would be detrimental to human society. And that's the question I think that everybody's still struggling with, right? Is is yeah. this sounds really interesting. It could be really helpful, but because it's so incredibly powerful, it scares us. And we're not quite sure what to do with that. Yeah. I mean, I think especially with like the digital twin and all of these aspects of AI, when I'm talking to companies and clients, I mean, you know, it's, it's the idea of it is a new tool. It's, and then it is just that a tool and you still have to have deep insights right. because at the end of the day, it can generate anything off of anything. So if you, you know, garbage in garbage out. And so it's not like it's going to generate magical things based on, you know, poor initial research. So it still needs to happen. So somebody's feeding those digital twins. <laughs> right. So, right. so that still needs to be there and you still have to have people who can action on it. So also the other thing is too, is, is that, uh, you know, you, you, most of these companies are going to need to do this baby step and, you know, cause the ones I think that, that jump too quickly are going to be the ones that fall fast. Yeah. yeah. Doing yeah, and we've seen that in other categories, right? I mean, uh, plant-based alternatives would be clearly one of those categories where the early adopters had some success, but there's been a lot of uh, 
a lot of crashes along the way. Yeah. So one thing that the, the, the company that does the digital twins, they talked about the fact they have to refresh them every 90 days mm. uh, to keep them current and up to date with what's going on. It's a hundred question questionnaire that they give to actual people who then fill out the questionnaire. And then that gives them the digital twin that they could use for the next three months. Mm. Did you, did so, you take the questionnaire? Did you did you get them to give you your own Do you have twin? a digital twin? I, I did not. Actually, you're speaking to my digital twin. This is not me. <laughs> so I'm actually so fishing somewhere in the Bahamas today. So <laughs> that's what I'm doing. That would be awesome. Wouldn't that be great? That would be, <laughs> that would be really nice. That would be yeah. really nice. Yeah. But then right. you know, what happens is your digital twin starts making promises that you can't keep. <laughs> well, that could be problematic. That could be problematic. Could be. All right, I want to go on to uh, switch switch gears one last time before we jump into the quiz and talk a yep. little bit about supplements. Uh, and I thought the whole Nutristax line was interesting. We, we've talked a little bit about Colgate before, and I noticed yes. you've made, made a passing reference to their uh, previous misstep in terms of expansion into <laughs> into <laughs> lasagna. Uh, I wrote without, Colgate without calling lasagna. Them out. But, but, but we, we figured that out. If you've, if you've not Googled Colgate lasagna, please do, because it's pretty darn funny. Yes. Um but I'm interested in, in kind of what's happening there. And then I mentioned this to a couple other people, and they immediately went to the, the, the challenge that you referenced, Kevin, was I am not in any way going to pick up a bar that I'm going to eat the wrapper from that has been sitting out in public. Well, that's not the intent, right? This is direct to consumer. Exactly. But yeah. what's going on with supplements? Supplement is interesting. I, it, there's two two areas that I find super interesting when it comes to food because they're they're getting closer to food every day, and that is supplements and beauty. And beauty is getting closer to supplements and supplements are getting closer to beauty and they're both getting closer to food. So if you look at that market, like there's a lot, especially if you go into any kind of beauty uh, store, it, even though the, the branding is all food related. And now with supplements, it's similar. And now you're seeing a company like Colgate trying to go the other way, which is how much can we become um, supplement like I didn't mention this in my newsletter, but I mean, I think there's something to the fact of like the, the amount of, um, range that supplements can have. I mean, they can say things that food cannot according mm -hmm. to current legal aspects of it. So there's some freeness, freeingness of that. Of course, I mean, for a big company, you know, there's always going to be potential, you know, legal hurdles to, to uncover, but I think what it is, is that, you know, they really do want to go into these new places. And, you know, if you look at a lot of the surveys done with, um, you know, Gen Z and maybe even younger millennials, the amount of credit that they give food or supplements to be able to do things, you know, the efficacy of it is quite high compared to, you know, uh, Gen X or Boomer. Um, so I think that there's, they, I think a lot of companies want to get there. They want to get closer to that because that's what consumers are asking for. They want these benefits. Uh, that maybe they couldn't get through food. So talk a little bit more about about the the relationship between beauty and food. I've not heard anybody describe it in that fashion before. Yes. There is so much um, uh, like, well, number one, beauty supplements that are, um, you know, like got food ingredients in them that they talk about, you know, this has been used you know, using food and it's all that, but also things that you put on your face, yeah. things that you put caffeine in your hair. Caffeine in my eye cream. Caffeine in your eye cream. Yeah. There's so much food. I mean, even the fact that in Korea, and I, did I talk about this with you before, but in Korea, so. it was very, it's actually quite common to have a little refrigerator in your bedroom or bathroom that you store beauty products in and that this whole little mm. mini refrigerator thing has actually started to become something becoming popular in niche parts of the U.S. to store beauty products because some of them are based off of very perishable food ingredients. So you're seeing this kind of combination, which I think is super interesting because I think some of the things that food previously had very hard time getting close to, like you know, food for beauty, like you see in maybe Asian markets with collagen is I think starting to come into the to the Western market. That's fascinating. So yeah, does the fascinating. does the caffeine in your eye cream keep your eyes open? Then is that is that no, the, no no? It's supposed to help like you more awake, tighten, and mm. um, dark eye circles is what it's it's supposed to be supposed to be for. But if you think about back, I mean the the beauty world was on organic mm -hmm, and plant based mm -hmm. decades ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, remember the, the old way to do it would put tea bags on your eyes. That right. used to be that's an right. old, yeah. yeah and that's caffeine. caffeine. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Makes perfect yeah. sense. Right. Sugar yeah. scrub in your shower. There you go. Sugar scrub. Oatmeal in your bathtub. Well, this goes back to our original conversation about clean. Clean started off as a beauty claim mm -hmm. that we had clean ingredients and it's the same thing. It's like, what's cleaner than food? Cause you actually put it in your body. So mm -hmm. I think there's something interesting there. 
Food on your face, Charlie. Food on your face. Food on your face. Mayonnaise on your hair. Beer. Wash your hair with beer. Beer. Yeah. Same thing. Beer and mayonnaise. Beer and mayonnaise. Hmm. Interesting combination. Okay. That would be a great product. Think about that. How about would you? What would you? Beer, beer and mayonnaise for hair. Well, for hair. Product? Anheuser Busch could do like a a mayonnaise or a beer uh, a beer rinse or something. I think they're likely to stick to their core brands here for a while, based on <laughs> based on recent experience. I would be sticking surprised to their to knitting. See them. Yeah, yeah. I, I see that. I don't see them expanding into, into the beauty products anytime soon. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Could be, could the next be wrong. Thing. I, I have to. I'm going to go out on a limb though, Kevin. I, I mean, I am, I don't have a crystal ball, but I I kind of liked. Colgate's Nutra Snacks. Oh, I, I agree. thought it was a. I thought it was a. I think they they have a reason to be able to get into this adjacency. They have. I agree. I yeah. think that. Uh, I think if there's an area that feels under uh, innovation, is it's um, it's like the mouth, it's the teeth, gum and, the, and mint, gum and mint. It feels like it hasn't been. I mean, other than you know whitening, I feel like it hasn't really. Yeah. There, there needs to be. Now it's trying a... to come back. It's actually that category is coming back. You remember it was on a long term decline before COVID. Yeah. COVID almost killed it, right? Because yeah. we were in masks. Yeah. Well, we're out and we're back and about now. So I, I think it's an interesting space. Yeah. Very okay. interesting. All right. We only have a few minutes left. It's time to transition to the oh, quiz. Yes. For me to be Charlie. So here we go. And hell freezes <laughs> over. <laughs> Charlie, you hear that? We're competitive. He yeah, I heard yeah, that. You're competitive. Kevin, Kevin was concerned about that. Because there's fun. nothing in this quiz about Turkey. Because I knew both of you probably were studying I Turkey. I really don't. I did trivia. not do anything. I don't. I don't ever study Okay. Quiz, I don't study. So. Okay. Yeah. This is Thanksgiving adjacent. And you're not so talking things. about Jim Harbaugh when you re- reference Turkey, are you? Or oh, something else? No. Or? Charlie. No. Okay. okay. You know, I can't help it that all the famous men in my <laughs> life that I respect have all become, you know what? <laughs> yeah. I can't say the word I want to say. Right. I probably okay. can, but I won't. There yeah. you go. Good for yeah. you. All Raise right. The so Raise the bar. things that Leave you along. would associate with Thanksgiving. So okay. first question, okay. deviled eggs or eggs that are stuffed with a filling are really old. They've been around since ancient Rome. Um, but today they are common very much across the world. Everyone has a deviled egg like thing. Hmm. Which of the following is not another term for a stuffed egg? Ooh. Okay. So name the one that's not a name for a stuffed egg. Is it eggs, mimosa, Russian eggs, casino eggs, or sunrise eggs? Which of these is not a name for a deviled egg like product? I'm going to go sunrise eggs. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same. I don't know why, but I'm gonna go sunrise eggs. You're both correct. It is. I must apparently huh. I did not do that. Yes, eggs mimosa is French. It's where you take the part of the yolk and you grate it over the the top, and it looks oh. like the mimosa tree if you've ever seen a mimosa tree. Oh, um, that's and where then they come Russian. From. I eggs. thought they just came in champagne glasses. Yeah, I, didn't I thought maybe, they came on yeah, a tree. Yeah, yeah. and then that's Russian awesome. eggs are partially filled with tuna. That comes from okay. like, Zara's I could, I could times. I could eat that. And then casino eggs are Hungarian. And they're usually served with horseradish cream sauce, which is quite good. Delicious too. It's very good. Okay. Oh, yeah. One to one. All right. Here we go. Okay. Where does the term, does the idiom to eat humble pie come from? Mm. Is it in the 18th century, an astronomer named James, James Humble spotted what he thought was a new planet and the public got really excited and they actually named a pie after him only for the planet to turn out to be a comet. So Mm. To eat humble pie. humble pie. That's one. Okay. Two, this humble comes from the word humble in English or numble in French for deer innards, which were usually reserved for the poor. So having to eat humble pie was seen as humbling. Was it a 19th century American company owned by Peter Humboldt boasted that their new uh, that they had found a new path to the Rockies? And to prove that they could get perishable product product through there faster, they transported fruit, vegetables, meats, and pastries, including pie, but all their product rotted. So eating humble pie would be eating rotten pie. Or was it last, for centuries, there was an English town called Humbleton that had a log sawing contest where the loser must need a pie made of sawdust. So eating Humbleton pie, which was later shortened to humble pie, was to lose. These Which are fantastic, is, man. I, the, the, are the, the lengths you go to to write creative descriptions are yes. really <laughs> impressive. Really impressive. Did so, is it the astronomer? I? Was you, that? I'm going to go. Did you say I? I? No, I don't. No, yeah, I should. Um, I'm, I'm going to go astronomer. I'm okay, going astronomer. deer innards. Susan is correct. It is Way deer to go, innards. Susan. 
So it is, if you've ever heard that, sometimes in British slang, they'll you end up dropping the H's. Humble just versus humble. Humble. humble yes. Die. So humble, humble is another term for like awful, which yeah. is also well, awful. Uh, yeah. Which is yeah. awful. Which is awful. awful is correct. awful. Yeah. All right. Susan is ahead. All right. Wow. I don't Number know how three. to act. Number three, how many leaves does it take to collect enough energy to make one apple? Leaves? Leaves. Like how many like, leaves okay. on an apple tree uh -huh. are, are required to oh. pull in enough energy to make one apple? Is it 10 leaves, 25 leaves, 50 leaves, or 100 leaves? 50? Okay. I'm going to go 25 just to be different, but I think it's probably 50. Susan is correct. It is yeah. 50. 50 yeah. leaves. That is according to Washington State's really? website. So they, they yes. know that? Apparently, oh, they've, they I'm sure they've measured it. Like, yeah, the, yeah, the amount of sun. 49 leaves, you don't get an apple. <laughs> as long as they're at those red, delicious apples, which are gross. Which are but, gross. Yes, that's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. All right. Number four, which of the following used to be a Thanksgiving tradition? Used to be. Was it A, children would parade the streets dressed in tattered clothes and masks holding, rag, holding ragamuffin parades and begging for money door to door? Was it B, a squash hiding contest where people would hide miniature pumpkins and squashes around the house and children would search for them on Thanksgiving morning? Was it C, a corn husk doll competition? People would dress up corn husk and win prizes for their creativity. Or was it D, a feast of lanterns? People would light tiny lanterns, one for each member of the house, and display them in their windows on Thanksgiving night. Which one of these was not or was? Which of the following it was? Was was a Thanksgiving tradition that now has gone away. I'm going to go lanterns. Lanterns. Okay. I'm going to go begging ragamuffin children. Susan is on a roll. Whoa! It is oh! right. You it are on is fire, girlfriend. Fire. You got to go to This never happened. Buy a lottery this is, ticket. So, yes, you should. Because yeah. this was actually this was actually called um, mumming. Uh, there's a called mumming. Mummer's Parade, if you've ever heard of that. I so this heard was of a that. Yes. thing. Yeah, mumming. The mummers queen parade. used to give do something for. Is there a Mummer's Day? A yes, mum there is Mummer's Day. Yes, in, yeah. in the UK. Yes. Yeah. So mumming or masking is something that children would do on Thanksgiving morning, and they would dress up like kind of like in ragged clothes, and they'd come around and they'd beg uh, for for money, and then of course that got kind of uh, out of out hand of after yeah. a while, so they yeah. stopped that. Hmm. Last question. I'm going to have to eat some deer innard pie. I can tell now already <laughs> that that's the the, the humble pie is coming my way. You're just letting me win because I'm always so downtrodden. What, what does Cool Whip have in common with Tang and Pop Rocks? Are they A, all have been to the moon? Is it B, they've all been featured in a 60s dessert? Is it C, they were all invented by the same food scientist? Or they're D, they all rely on nitrogen gas as a major ingredient? I'm going C. So they were all invented by the same food scientists. Yes. Okay. And that can't Susan? be right. Uh, go I'm going to go 60s dessert. Okay. Yeah. Charlie is correct. They were all invented by the same food scientist. I a man named the same company. William Mitchell was a food scientist behind all of them. He worked for General Foods in the 1960s, and they all were at one point from General Foods. They now split, like Kraft owns Cool Whip and all that stuff. Or as Stewie on uh, Family Guys call it, Cool Whip. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yes he invented all of them so quite a uh, legend in food scientist we, we don't we don't I, I like cool whip, but we don't use it in our house we whip from heavy whipping cream but i would okay. prefer i mean either one's good you lose not. access to the, the wonderful uh containers <laughs> yes <Yeah>. that's right <laughs> you would store your food in until it turned green and then throw it out because you had no exactly. idea what was actually in the container exactly but overall susan susan won I'm not I can't worthy. believe I actually I'm won. Yes, wow. you did. I am going to go buy a lottery ticket or something. You should. It's a good yeah. day. It's a good day. All I'm right. Hey, good. thank you, both of you. I'm thankful to be friends with you, to be able to be colleagues with you. So enjoy your Thanksgiving. And for those of you who are listening, if you've not yet had your Thanksgiving, have a great Thanksgiving. If you had, we hope it was delicious and you did not have any deer innard pie. Uh, we will catch up with you again in December on the next edition of Three Squares. Don't forget, you can always reach out to us at Three Squares Mail, the numeral three squares mail at gmail.com. Susan, Kevin, have a happy Thanksgiving. You too, Charlie. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.